Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Compass Christian Church. How y'all doing this morning? Yeah, all right. How y'all doing this morning? Y'all doing good? Oh, yeah. Well, hey, I'm E.L. Jones, and along with Mike Lynn, who's preaching today, we are the preaching ministers here at the church, and we're glad that you're here with us today. Uh, we love to take some time, kind of carve some time out in our service just to kind of welcome our first-time guests, uh, or maybe this is your second or third time. We are just so thankful that you're here. And maybe you're like, man, I don't know what this is all about. Like someone told me to show up and next thing I know I'm parking in a field and, but they do have whipped cream for coffee, so that's cool. But I'm, I'm just glad you're here nonetheless. And what we like to do during this time as well is just invite kind of a connection thing. So if you'd like to connect with us, if, if you enjoy the service, you enjoy the church, like you can text the word connect to the number on the screen. But another really good way that you can connect with us is just come talk to Mike and I after the service or anyone that you think kind of you know knows what they're doing just invite you know just hey i'm, I'm so and so my first time and and i just you know just just make that connection we go we love to we love to meet new people and stuff so we're glad you're here we're going to pray for this for the for the worship for the sermon and, and just for all the things so if y'all just bow with me right now and uh, let's just go to god right now in prayer god we do thank you for today we thank you for a time where we can just just pause a little bit and just reflect on Jesus. God, be with us now as we enter into this time of worship. May it be pleasing to you. May it bring you glory and honor and praise. And Father, I just pray that, uh, Lord, as we lift these words up and as we lift these songs up, God, that uh, we do so with a, with a heart that is just knowing and understanding how much you mean to us, God. And I pray all this now in your son's name. Amen. Let's rise our feet, church, and let's sing praises to our King.
his body breaking I see his fingers bleeding I see the darkness tremble at the ground below his feet And in the darkest hours There
when God sent his son to die on the cross for our sins, all of our sins, his love, that love changed everything for us. So we're going to remember that. We're going to go into our time of communion. So around the room, there's tables. If you haven't already picked up your communion, you can do so during this next song. If you're visiting with us today, welcome. We're glad you're here. I want you to know that the cups are double stacked. So please make sure that you grab both cups. And upon returning to your seat, so we'll do communion until after the meditation and we'll all do communion together. But at this time, you may make your way to the tables.
Y'all may be seated. You know, uh, if you're if you're like me, um, I was about to say if you're normal, <laughs> I'm not normal. But if you're uh, if you are like me, you're probably busy, right? You got a lot going on, a lot happening. Um, maybe some of y'all even had a conversation in your head, like, do I have time to go to church today? Like, maybe I can just watch it later. Like, we just, we have a lot going on, and uh, and if you're a parent in the room. Um, I feel like it even doubles, right? And you're, you're playing like, you know, sh uh, just chauffeuring kids all around with practices or school stuff or drop off or friends or sp overnights. And then you got weekend things. And, you know, then there's all the stuff that you have to do. And there's, there's, it just piles up a whole lot. And then on top of all that, like, then you got the news. Uh, you, you turn on the news and it's like just stuff that's happening all around the world. It's devastating. It's, it's hurtful. And, and then, you know, you just, it just kind of keeps going. And then, you feel like, okay, now the thing that refreshes me is what? It's the Word of God, right? And then praying and reading God's Word and, you know, going to church. And then sometimes that even becomes a chore because you're so busy, you're not able to read God's Word and you're not able to pray like you really want to pray or have family devotions like you want to have family devotions. And now that starts to pile on and now you start feeling bad because you're like, oh man, like I'm not doing the things that I know I need to be doing to help refresh for all the things that I need. And it just, just keeps going, right? And I'm reminded through the word of God that um, Jesus, I mean, it's normal because he even says, like, hey, you're going to be you're going to be facing some times of worry and, and, and you'll be weary at times. And Peter talks about it, too. He kind of talks about the anxiety of life and like the stresses of life. And he gives this really cool encouragement in first Peter five, seven, where it says, cast all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. And I just, I love that verse. I love that verse because Jesus Christ is the one and the only that can really take what you got going on in life and he, he can really hold that together. He is the sustainer of all things. And Jesus says these words in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He says, come to me all who are weary and burdened. And what is he going to do? He, he says, I will give you rest, sweet rest for your souls, right? And so as we come around this table every week, every Sunday, we want to remember Jesus Christ. And a good reason why is I got a, in my back pocket a remote control, right? Oh, yeah. You know, you can, give, you can give a man a remote control, and he doesn't need all them directions, right? He don't need them instructions. No, he throws them right out. I know how to work this thing, right? 
And, uh, but there's a button on the remote control. If you got DVR, or now, especially nowadays, or you're watching stuff on Netflix or whatever it is, there's this button. It's called a pause button, right? Who likes the pause button? Right? You boop, pause that. <laughs> Some of y'all might want to pause me right now. Pause, you know. That'd be cool, you know, a preacher pause. Um, but communion to me is like a pause. I get to hit the pause from all the distractions of the world. I, I, the pause from the news and a pause from all my busy schedules and a pause from just my, just what's happening. And I get to, though it's a few moments, reflect on Jesus Christ and only him. So as we gather around this table, let's hit pause. Let's be still and know that he is God. And let's reflect on Jesus. Let us pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We, we thank you for the rest that we can find and the comfort that is there for us. That for all who are weary and heavy laden, God, I pray they will come to you and find rest for their souls. As we take of this bread that represents your body, as we take of this cup that represents the blood that was poured out on Calvary, Lord, I pray that we can just pause and remember Jesus Christ, our King and our Savior. In his name I pray, amen. At this time, church, let's remember Jesus. So the story is told of a young fellow who had just been hired as a new CEO of a large corporation. The previous CEO who had been fired met with this new hiree privately in his office and handed him three numbered envelopes. He said to the young uh, CEO, he said, open these if you run against a problem that you don't think you can solve. Well, things went along pretty smoothly for this new CEO for the first six months, but then the sales began to take a downward turn. The new CEO began catching a lot of flack for it, and so he remembered those three envelopes in his drawer, and so he went to his drawer and he took out the first envelope, opened it up, and the message simply read, blame your predecessor. And so that's what he did. He called for a press conference the next day, and he tactfully laid the blame at the feet of the previous CEO, and just as the envelope had said to do. Well, sales began to pick up, and the problem was soon behind him. About a year later, the company was once again experiencing a slight dip in sales, and there had been some product malfunctions, and having learned from his previous experience, the young CEO opened up the second envelope. And the second envelope had just a one-word message that said, reorganize. And so that's what he did. And the company quickly rebounded. Well, after several consecutive profitable quarters, the, son, the company once again fell on hard times. And so this CEO went back into his office, closed the door, and opened up the third envelope. The third message simply read, prepare three envelopes. There you go. I wasn't sure if all of you would get that this morning or not. If you didn't get it, just bump your neighbor and say, can you explain to me what he meant by that joke? You know, how we respond in times of crisis, I think, reveals a lot about our character. And for the Christian, and that's who I want to speak to this morning, for the Christian, it reveals a lot about your relationship with the Lord. In other words, in times of crisis, there ought to be an intensity about your spiritual walk that is both undeniable and unashamed. 
Now, let me recount for just a moment for those of you who may be visiting with us. We've been in a sermon series from the book of Colossians, going through it verse by verse. And so if you have your Bibles with you this morning or, or if you've got a cell phone that's got a Bible app, go ahead and get it out. Open it up to the New Testament book of Colossians and uh, uh, chapter 3 is where we'll be picking up this morning. Last month, we studied the first two chapters of the book of Colossians and we found out exactly who Jesus is. Jesus Christ is Lord over all, as you see by the, the slide there. Well, two weeks ago, we came to a pivotal transition in the book of Colossians where we see how Jesus moves from being Lord over all to seeing Jesus as Lord over me. In other words, it becomes more practical. Now, this transition is rather typical for many of the Apostle Paul's letters to the churches. He begins the first half of his letter very often by teaching us what we need to believe. We talked about that. That's doctrine what we need to believe. And then in the second half of most of his letters, he then begins to teach us how we should behave. What we need to believe, doctrine, and how we should behave, duty. Two weeks ago, E.L. used the analogy of a mud pit, and, and his challenge to us was, if you're really serious about dying to your old way of life and allowing Jesus to transform your life, then you've got to, as E.L. said, you've got to make a wardrobe change. You've got to remove some of those old muddy garments that you're wearing and you need to clothe yourself with the attributes of Christ, compassion and love and forgiveness. Last week, we looked at another practical application of Paul's writings as E.L. challenged us in the home, the wife, the husband, the children, and the father, to possibly make some judgments. Remember E.L. said last week, maybe some, there are some of you wives who need to honor your husbands rather than to control them. Maybe there are some of you husbands who need to treat your wife more like a queen than a maidservant. Maybe there are some of you young people who need to trust and obey your parents rather than constantly question and complain. And maybe there are some of you dads who need to encourage your families rather than constantly reacting with anger. If you weren't here last week and didn't get to see that sermon, I would challenge you to get on our website, go up to the resources tab, choose messages, and listen to last week's sermon. I guarantee you, it will benefit you and your family. Well, today we're going to continue in Paul's letter to the Colossians with a realistic challenge to all of us to demonstrate an intense spiritual walk with God. And not only when there's a tragedy. You know, we so often run to God when a crisis happens. But I want to talk about those times when, when we're living the mundane, the, the monotony of our lives. Today I want to challenge you, or at least share with you how I think Jesus can intensify our daily lives, whether it be in the workplace or whether it be witnessing to those around us. Again, we're going to look at a passage from Colossians chapter 3. We're going to pick up in verse 23 this morning that talks about that intensity. And it begins with the place where maybe it's the toughest to be intense about your faith, and that is the workplace. How many of you here work a regular job? I mean 40 hours a week. Raise your hand if you do. That's the majority of you here. Good. This message is going to be very applicable to you this morning. Let me ask you a simple question, those of you who raised your hands. What kind of example are you setting for those that you work with and those that you work for? See, Colossians chapter 3, let's pick up, well, let's pick up in verse 22, our text for today, where it reads, Slaves, obey your masters in everything. And do it not only when their eye is on you and to win their favor, but with sincerity of heart and reverence for the Lord. Now, let me explain this passage in context. You see, back in those days, in that setting, it was wise for a master to treat his slave well. Now, it's funny, when we usually think of slavery, we think about the time in America, just before the Civil War, when a person was forced to work against his or her, or his or her will. They were enslaved. But as I've often said, slavery in the Bible usually occurred when somebody was indebted to someone else. And as a result, they were to be that person's slave until they could repay back the debt. And so many times, because of that, the relationship between a slave and his master became almost as close as that of a family member. In fact, in biblical times, slaves were often allowed to eat at the table with the family when hired people, other workers, would not have that luxury. 
And so in biblical times, there was often appreci- there was a, an appreciation for the slaves, those who were indebted to their masters. And there was supposed to be, on the part of the slave, a passion to serve and to work hard. It was that balance between being a good slave to the master, or a master to the slave, but also a good slave to his or her master. And it's that thought that I want us to bring up, begin with today. Because I think as in employees, that's my phrase, those of us who've been hired to do a job, those of, those of you who raised your hand earlier, you work a regular job, I think it's our responsibility as employees to serve well. And so bearing that thought in mind, let me ask you this question. When the heat is on, when the pressure at work is intense, what do your coworkers observe about you? Is your faith evident to them? You see, Paul says that we're to work not just because the boss is watching when, when, his, when their eye is on you, but we're to do it all the time. I don't need to tell you that video and security surveillance has become big business in recent years. In fact, if the truth be told, most of our surveillance has now to do not so much with the customer, but rather more with the employees. Why? Because employers just can't trust employees when they're not around. There's an old saying that goes, when the cat's away, the the mice will play. When the boss is not there, people tend to slack off. I may never have told you this, but my mother, before she passed away, worked for the Burger King Corporation for more than 30 years. She began her job as an hourly employee and worked herself up into management, and she eventually became a very very highly sought after and highly paid store manager. Now, her job was different. She would be the manager that would be hired to go into a financially struggling store. And her job was to turn it around and make it profitable for the owner. Now, as a result, she would be financially compensated well for all of her hard work. Well, later in my mother's life, as a result of her diabetes, she eventually lost both of her legs through amputation and was unable to physically work. But there came a time when the Burger King Corporation contacted my mother and offered her another kind of job. They installed in our home a computer system that would allow my mother to watch and manage several Burger King stores through the use of installed video cameras at the store. You've seen those, haven't you, all over the little restaurants there. Her primary job now was to do whatever was necessary to help those stores to function properly and more efficiently. If she saw a problem via the video camera, if she saw a problem, then she was to call the manager of that store and she was to instruct that person to do whatever necessary to correct the problems that she had witnessed. Now her secondary job was to watch for employee dishonesty. And that came through watching for theft, or employees that were slacking off or standing around, or even watching if improper procedures were being followed. And she had, on more than one occasion, she had employees reprimanded or or fired for what she saw and recorded through the use of those video cameras. Yes, my mom was a snitch. (laughs) But she was a paid snitch. Hey, if you can't do the crime, don't do the, I mean, if you can't do the time, don't do the crime, right? Now, whether it's an actual presence of our employer or whether it's the knowledge of knowing that we're being watched by video camera, some people, let's be honest, are only motivated to work diligently and honestly if they know the boss is watching them. I love the story about the three boys who were bragging about how fast their father was. One boy boasted, well, my dad can shoot a bow and arrow, and when he shoots the arrow, he can beat the arrow to the target. Now, you got to be honest, that's fast. That's a little bit of an exaggeration, but that's fast. Well, the next boy, not to be outdone, said, well, my dad's so fast that when he shoots his gun at a deer, he can get there before the deer even falls and begin to field dress it. Well, the third boy, not to be outdone, said, that ain't nothing. My dad's even faster than that. My dad gets off at work at 5 o'clock, but he's at home every day at 4.30. (laughs) 
Now, as a Christian, we're called to be distinctive, yes. We're called to let our witness be enhanced by our work because we work wholeheartedly. We give ourselves fully to the job that we've been given because we represent Jesus Christ. That means that, means that we don't steal from work, even if it's just those little small items. That means during crunch times, we help out in areas that, are, that aren't in our job description. That means that we're honest when we report our expenses. That means that we're on time for work. That means that when we are work, we're focused on the job rather than spending all day searching the Internet, whether it be our, our Facebook or our Instagram or TikTok or Snapchat or whatever it is. Folks, you are called as a servant of God to do everything with excellence. And I challenge you to take heart what you represent as Jesus Christ, what you represent to your employer and to those you work with. Let's move on. Let's go look at the next verses, verses 23 and 24. Paul writes, whatever you do, Paul writes this, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for men, since you know that you will receive an inheritance for the, from the Lord as a reward. It is the Lord Christ that you are serving. Folks, that tells me that you need to see your job as a partnership with God. Your job is more than just a job. It's a ministry that God has allowed you to play a part of. You know, Myron Bush in his book, The Lord of the Marketplace, says, Satan's immaculate deception is that we send some people into full-time Christian work, and he's talking about preachers, teachers, ministry people. We send some people into full-time Christian work, and the others, the rest of us, are mere spectator Christians in our jobs. And he says that's not true. Regardless of employer, we're all working for the Lord. Does that make sense? It's just not the paid preacher. It's every one of you who punched the clock tomorrow. The Apostle Paul is saying in this passage that as God's servants, you are called to work for your employers as if you're working for the Lord. Because you are. Paul says it's the Lord Christ that you're serving. So are you there just to pick up a paycheck? Or are you really trying to serve the Lord in whatever capacity He's placed you in. Now, in verse 25, Paul says, anyone who does wrong will be repaid for his wrong, and there is no favoritism. In other words, what Paul is saying is, you get what you deserve. In other words, if you don't work hard at your job, then you're going to be passed up for a promotion. Or you may even lose your job. I heard about one man who was let go by his boss for, because he a poor performance. The problem was both he and the employee the employer and the employee went to the same church. And the employee, when he was let go, looked across to the table at the boss, at his boss, the employer, and said, and I thought you were a Christian. To which the Christian employer said to himself, it was all I could do to not to look at this man and say, I thought you were a Christian as well. See, the expectation is that we both, whether employer or employee, were as working for the Lord. And folks, if you're to work with intensity, and I think we're called to do that, then that means that we take our jobs seriously. We put our best foot forward, and we realize that whatever job we have, we perform that job as if we're working for the Lord, because we are. Well, not only should employees serve well, but I think employers must lead well. Anybody here in management, raise your hand if you're in charge of people on your job site. I don't have as many managers as I do hourly employees. Anybody have your own business, by the way? Anybody got their own business? Good, okay. Listen to me if you don't mind for just a moment, because I think here in Colossians chapter 4, Paul has something very pertinent. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Paul writes, masters. I think we can translate the word employers there, because we understand the concept. Masters provide for your slaves. Now, we can transpose the words employees there. So employers, he says, provide for your employees what is right and fair, because you know that you also have a master in heaven. Now, let me again speak to those of you who are the boss at work, those of you who manage employees, those of you who have your own businesses, those of you who raised your hands down earlier. Let me share with you a couple of things that I think you, as an employer, as a manager, as a boss, need to provide for your employees. If you want to write these down, I think it would be great. I had a gentleman in the first service that came to me and said he runs his own business, and he said, I wrote those down. I'm dedicating myself to try to provide those for my employees. And I commended him for that. 
Here they are, real quick. Number one, I think you need to prepare, I think you need to provide fair wages. You need to make certain that your people are paid a fair wage. Secondly, I think you need to provide a good work environment. In other words, you need to give them a setting where they can work or you need to provide for them the tools that they need to accomplish that job. Thirdly, I think you need to communicate with them. In other words, you keep them informed about what's happening. You can't come in on Thursday and say, I need this by Friday. That's not fair to them. That's not fair to you. If a little bit of communication could have helped with that, then I think you need to make an effort to do that. You don't need to tell them everything that's going on, but you need to let them know what's going on that applies to them. And fourthly, I think you need to provide godly leadership. That's so important because in most jobs, we don't see that. And I think as a, as a model employer, you do well to lead well. You be the model employer. Lee Strobel tells about the time years ago when he worked on staff with a minister friend of his by the name of Bill Hybels in Chicago. Now, Bill Hybels was the senior minister, and he came to Strobel one day, and he said, Lee, he said, Lee, I hear that you're working 14-hour days, 17, or excuse me, 14-hour days, seven days a week. Well, Strobel was expecting a pat on the back because he was working so hard. And so he kind of looked back at Hybels and rather sheepishly said, yes, uh, that's true. And Bill Hybels looked at Lee Strobel and said, Lee, you get your life in order or you're fired. You see, he understood. Folks, if God has placed you in a position of leadership, a position where you have authority over others, then make it your goal to lead in such a godly way. Lead with integrity, lead with equality, so that other people take note of that. Employers, help your employees recognize that there are things in life that are more important than that job, namely their relationship with their Lord and their relationship with their families. Don't grind them with these long hours that rob them of family time and personal life. By the same, to by the same token, make certain that they're diligent about their, what, they're, what you expect of them and expect them to work hard for you, especially when you pay them well. Help them to do the best job that they can do at work so that they can do the best job that they do at home as well. Does that make sense? Okay, so you see, we put so much emphasis on a person's livelihood and, and titles that sometimes we send a message about priorities. You want to make more money, you have to work more hours. You, you want to be, move up in the company, that means you may have to step on people's as you make your way up there. But understand this, folks, God didn't put you on this earth to make a living. God put you on this earth to make a difference. And there's a difference between the two. Now, I know you have to make a living, but don't make having to make a living become the number one priority in your life at the expense of your family or at the expense of your relationship with God. Again, God put you here so that you could make a difference. And when you see your job as a ministry, as a labor of love for the Lord, then the impact that you can have for him will be immeasurable, whether you're an employer or whether you're an employee. Well, it's not only our daily life at work that we need to live with intensity, but I think our relationship with those around us ought to be one of intensity as well. And that's why my second point is this. We've talked about our, our working with intensity. Let's talk about our witnessing with intensity because I think Paul begins to address that in verses 2 and 3. In verses 2 and 3 of our text, Paul begins to make this transition once again. And this time he says in verse 2, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And then Paul goes on to ask, he says, and pray for us too that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Now, understand, Paul is challenging you to, to witness with intensity. Now, how do you do that? Number one, you do that through your prayer life. And so let me ask you the question, how much intensity is there in your prayer life? Paul uses that phrase, devote yourselves to prayer. That word devote implies a persistence or a fervor about it. Three different times, think about it, three different times in those two verses, Paul calls on the church at Colossae to pray, to use this vehicle of prayer that God has given so that God may open up doors of opportunity for them. And so that's my challenge for you. Tomorrow morning, as you get into your car, as you begin to make your way to work tomorrow, would you begin by praying, God, would you give me an opportunity today would you open up a door of opportunity that I might glorify you this day? Dwight Zandler puts it this way, we ought to talk to God about people before we talk to people about God. 
And so my challenge to you tomorrow morning is talk to God about the people that you work with tomorrow. Lord, provide for me an opportunity to make a difference in, in someone's life today. And if you want to witness to someone, if you want to share your faith with someone, it begins by praying, not preaching, folks. Talk to God about people before you talk to people about God. Paul goes on to say in verse 4, from a prison cell, again, Paul writes these words, pray that I might proclaim it. Now, he's talking about sharing the good news of Jesus. Pray that I might proclaim it clearly as I should. Now, think about that. Here's the apostle Paul, probably one of the greatest theologians next to Jesus that ever lived, and certainly one of the greatest missionaries, and he is pleading for this cover of prayer so that he doesn't say the wrong thing. It's funny, later in Ephesians chapter 6, Paul would write, pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given to me that I might fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am, in, which I am ambassadors in chains. And Paul says, pray that I might declare it fearlessly. Again, the greatest preacher of the New Testament, or one of the greatest preachers of the New Testament says, pray that I might be able to say the right words the right way. Folks, when it comes to sharing your faith, hear me when I say this. It's not so much of a question of how much you've studied or how much you've prepared as much as how much you've prayed. And so my challenge to you is begin your spiritual walk with prayer. God, would you open up an opportunity for me today to, to make a difference in someone's life for your sake and for your glory? So number one, witnessing comes through prayer. Number two, witnessing comes through how we live. Look at verse 5. Paul goes on to say, Be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Now again, here the Apostle Paul is challenging us, the Christian community, to be prudent and to be tactful in order that we might not antagonize or alienate those who are not believers. It's not your job to go out and make people feel uncomfortable about their relationship with the Lord. I know some of you think that's your passion, that's your gift, and so you're quick to tell everybody what they're doing wrong instead of being more worried about maybe they can do better. Does that make sense to what I'm saying? Again, the challenge for you there. The way that we live should attract people to want to hear more about Jesus, to want to hear more about the difference that he's making in our life. That's why Paul says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. Folks, if you're praying for those opportunities to make a difference in somebody's life, then like Paul says, you make the most of those opportunities. You communicate to that person what's really important. It's not what they're doing wrong. It's what God can do right in their life. In other words, our lifestyle, our words should communicate to an unbeliever what their real priorities ought to be. One writer says it like this. We pray for open doors, but then we walk around with our eyes closed. I taught you, I've asked you to get up tomorrow morning, God Help me have an opportunity to make a difference in someone's life. Then when you get out of that car and you go in and punch that clock, you begin to look and to listen for those opportunities because God will cross your path with someone else's path who desperately needs to hear some good news for that day. But yet we got our eyes closed to it. And we keep saying, preacher, I don't know what you're talking about up there. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 20 says it this way. Paul says, we are therefore Christ's ambassadors. You know what an ambassador is, don't you? somebody who represents another country. You represent another country to the unbeliever. We are Christ ambassadors. One writer says, as Christ ambassadors, all we want to do is hang around the embassy when we need to be out into the world. And that's what we want to do. We love coming here. It energizes us. It motivates us. The problem is we don't always, we're not always quick to go out there and represent Christ. How intentionally are you about sharing your faith? Maybe that's a question that you need to seriously consider this morning. So let's retract real quick. We witness through how we pray. We witness through how we live. And finally, I think Paul says we can witness through what we say. Uh, look at verse 6 of chapter 4. Paul writes, Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. Now, I wish we could go into the salt part. That's a sermon in and of itself. You know, salt has a lot of different purposes. But what I want to concentrate on what Paul is saying earlier there. Paul is saying that we need to speak with clarity as we convey the gospel. In other words, we need to choose our words carefully 
and choose our words wisely. Carefully and wisely. Kind of reminds me of the story of the young mother who talked about the following. She said, we had just moved into this new neighborhood, and fortunately my son had made several new friends, and so his birthday was coming up, and so I invited these 10 friends to a birthday party. Well, they all happily arrived, and when the time came to open up presents, the mother said, I was surprised to see that he received eight different sweaters from the different boys. She said, I was visiting with one of the mother, mothers a little later, and I shared with her my dilemma about the duplication of all the sweaters, and she said, the mother said rather tersely to me, well, you're the one who wrote on the invitation what you wanted us to buy. And so the young mother was stunned in silence trying to understand what the other mother had said, and then it finally dawned on her. You see, the party was being held down in their basement, which was always cool, and so she had written on the invitation, please have your child bring a sweater. <laughs> see what I mean when I say you need to choose your words carefully, you need to choose them wisely. And be honest, sometimes equally important to what you have to say is how you choose to say it. The Apostle Peter, imagine this, probably one of the most outspoken of Jesus' followers. Many times, remember, he would talk before he thought. He says in, verse, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, In your hearts set apart Christ as Lord. And then he goes on to say, Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give a reason for the hope that you have. And then Paul writes this, But do this with gentleness and respect. Boy, that's a lesson learned for the Apostle Peter there. Folks, let me close. Let me close with this final observation. Intense times, and believe me, I think we're living in some intense times. Intense times require an, int an intense Christianity. And hear me, if Jesus really is the Lord of your life, then you shouldn't be looking for opportunities to cower in a corner. You should be looking for opportunities to share your faith with anyone and everyone who will listen. And it doesn't always mean book, chapter, and verse. Sometimes it's a simple invite to church. Sometimes it's a simple let me pray with you or let me pray for you. Sometimes it's just them, it's you telling them the difference that Jesus is making in your life. It doesn't have to be this great theological discussion. Just say to them, let me just talk to you about the difference since I've been going to church or the difference since I was baptized. Sometimes it's just that testimony that you share. And then sometimes it's sitting down with someone and trying to answer some of the life's most difficult questions through Scripture. Folks, living a life surrendered, surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ can free us in so many different ways. Two of those that we read about in the book of Colossians are working and witnessing with intensity. You see, and here's my point, only Jesus Christ can take what we perceive to be mundane, to be monotonous. I'm talking about our workplace, our daily interaction with people. Only Jesus Christ can take what we perceive as mundane and monotonous and transform it into a ministry that honors him. I'm going to ask our praise team to come on back up. And as they do, I want to say this final thing. I said it in the first service, and I just want to reiterate this. You know, so often when we call our praise team up, we immediately, we, sitting in the crowd, we immediately begin to turn our minds off. Oh, we're done. Here comes the praise team. We're going to sing one more song. They're going to come up and make some announcements. By the way, we're not going to make announcements anymore. You haven't called on. We're making those at the beginning of the service. And so we just kind of tune ourselves out. When we stand or some of you leave and think, I've got to get, beat someone in the parking lot or I've got to get out of here quicker. And I'm not sure your reason, but I just wanted you to understand that what we're about to do can be the most important part of this entire service to somebody sitting here. Because we're offering an, an invitation, an opportunity for someone to surrender their life to Christ. We're not just singing a song just to sing a song. We're singing a song so that someone might take advantage of this opportunity to begin their walk with Jesus. And if you're that person here this morning, then this opportunity is for you. I'm going to make my way down front. And my hope is that you'll meet me down here. I'll share with you from God's word what you need to do, or we'll begin a conversation today that hopefully will lead you to the understanding of what Jesus wants in your life. But it begins by you first accepting that offer. 
So while the rest of us stand and sing, maybe you'll meet me down front. Let's do just that. Let's stand. Let's turn it over to our praise team. And if you want to talk to someone about Jesus, you meet me down here in front. to hell. 